It's time for Chess Chest! What? No, 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 no. Chess Chest. Welcome to another Down the Rabbit Hole video, and this is another in my Chess Chest series. Love the game of chess, really want to talk about it, and I need to talk about it more often. I need to ramp these up a bit because I got a pretty got positive response so far. Uh, I've talked about my interest in the game. I've talked about the board. Now I want to talk about each of the little guys on the board themselves. Showcase each one. And I want to start with the lowly pawn. The poor little fella who kind of gets a bad rap. I mean, uh, there's so many of them and they move so slowly and they're very easily taken that they have kind of... I don't know, I'm sure these other pieces look down their nose at the lowly pawn. And we have phrases in our uh, our figures of speech to talk about, you know, being a pawn being moved around on a board. Um, so what's sad is, okay, so the pawn is derived from the French word, I think it's, it's P-A-O-N. How would you pronounce that? Pawn, I believe, which is ironically similar to the gaming turn, getting pwned. But uh, anyway, uh, yes, pawn is uh, the French word for foot soldier. So these were the foot soldiers in the army. Uh, but that word is actually kind of also related to peon, which in um, sort of older uh, English terminology is sort of peasants and the, uh, the common man. So, so, so the, the pawn has a little bit of a connotation of being both uh, the foot soldier, the common man, and um, funnily enough, in some versions, the name of each of the pawns was actually described. Uh, depending on which row he's in, he actually has his own name. In medieval chess, this one here on the leftmost row, this was the gambler. Next to him was the city guard. Next to him was the innkeeper. In front of the king, we have the merchant. That probably speaks volumes. In front of the queen, we have the doctor. Again, there's probably a connection there. In front of the bishop, over on this side, the weaver. And then on the final two rows, we have the blacksmith and the farmer or general worker. Um, so, yeah, this is what the rank and file of the pawns was considered in medieval chess. But I want to take you further back. Uh, I mentioned that when I talked about the chess board, it was actually derived from an Indian game, which in and of itself was probably resulting from the ancient Chinese game, Shang-Chi. And in Shang-Chi, they had a row of pawns, front foot soldiers, main guys on the front row. Shang-Chi came from the Han Dynasty in around 200 BC. And they had already, before they had established these other pieces, there was this other game, board game, that was around during that time that had a square board, had little the little soldiers that would move around on it, and you would roll dice or like sticks. You would actually basically, it was a game sort of a chance. It derived actually from a fortune telling idea. We'll get to that in a sec. But the hands had these boards sitting around with these little pawns already on them. And when Shang-Chi was eventually developed, the pawn kind of became that front row foot soldier fella. But that's the, that's the interesting connection. It actually predates all these other guys by a long stretch, 200 BC before for this little guy. Let's talk about that early game, game that the pawn was originally found on. It's, I call it a game in quotes. Uh, it did become kind of a roll the dice, move the pieces around the board. Uh, kind of like Parcheesi or Pachisi, the Indian game. Um, there was also the royal game of Ur. Again, move the pieces around the board. And the idea of rolling either dice or tossing sticks to determine where you're going to move, uh, that was very popular and very well known in a lot of ancient cultures. To slightly sidetrack, I do have another ancient game that moves little pieces around a board. And I just wanted to use it as an example of what this ancient Chinese thing was. I actually have a game of Senet, which is an Egyptian game. You can see there's like these uh, hieroglyphics around the side.
basically you've got your little pieces here that start on the board. I believe they go around each other. Yeah, so we've got our uh, little cones and our little drums. And I won't set the whole thing up, but what you would do is you would throw sticks to determine who moves up and down this grid until they eventually get to the final stage of being, which is actually you want to die and go to the afterworld. <laughs> oh, Egypt. Yeah, the objective of Senate is to die. You gotta love those guys. But what I wanted to point out with this game is it also used sticks that were just tossed, and depending on the way the sticks landed, that would actually determine how far you move up and down the board. It was an early version of dice. There's a connection, I think, between this Senate game and the game that I'm about to talk about. This philosophy, this idea of throwing sticks to see if you will enter the afterworld, was actually very similar to the Chinese game called Liyobo, L-I-U-B-O, uh, which literally translates to six sticks. You had a board with pawns, and what would happen is you would actually throw sticks. I believe it was kind of a fortune-telling original thing where they would perhaps um, chant or make a wish or prepare themselves for the fates to determine their, their direction that they're going to go with something, and they would move a pawn on a very strange-looking board to a predetermined position, and you would eventually, I believe it was a, um, a river in the center, or the ocean, and you would move around, and it's, it's fascinating. I've seen pictures of this Leobo game, but to wind back a little bit here and, and concentrate on chess itself, um, the pawn appeared first in Leobo as this representation of your fate, as you are determining what your future is going to be. What is your fortune? Throw the sticks, move to wherever you are determined to go, and I guess they would maybe make decisions on their lives. I, I think almost it might have been like an early tarot card reading thing. I think it's on that sort of level. So that's Leobo. That's from the Han Dynasty 200 BC, thousands of years ago. When Han Xin, the general who created Shang-Chi, was trying to grab pieces to display for his audience what was going on, how he was going to move his army, he had Leobo boards just kicking around, and he would stick the pawns that were there on the board. And then I mentioned when I talked about the checkerboard, then the grid, box, the grid board for, from Go was also used. It eventually became the game of Shang-Chi, the one that we understand. Sadly, as the Han Dynasty declined, the interest in Liobo went away, everybody started playing Go and or Shang-Chi that was eventually evolved out of uh, Han Xin's little display for his army. And therefore, that's where the chess board comes from, and that's where the chess pieces come from, and the lowly pawn is that old. It's actually from a game that predates chess, or even chess's great-grandfather. So the pawns actually got some pretty good history to them. Now, uh, to bring it back up to kind of modern tale, I made an interesting discovery uh, late in my um, gaming with uh, uh, chess at large. Um, I really enjoyed chess as a kid. I played it on the Atari 2600. I'm going to do that later in this series. I played against other people. Had a blast, really enjoyed uh, chess. And then I got a little portable chess game, which I'm going to be showing again in a future episode of this series. And there was one time the chess uh, computer opponent made a move that I thought, oh, I've got a broken machine here. I'll have to show you on the board here what happened. So the opponent's pawn was getting very close to my uh, front row of pawns myself. And I thought, okay, I better move out of here because I want to free up uh, some of my pieces behind. So since it was my first move, I took my uh, pawn and I moved up two so that he couldn't actually take me. And the computer opponent then moved behind my pawn and indicated that that was taken from the board. And I thought, 
how how did the pawn take my piece that that didn't even touch it you you can only go on a diagonal as a pawn this move was apparently called en passant or in passing it's a french uh, move and uh, it's actually been added to the game since the 15th century but i never knew it and nobody i ever played against ever used this en passant move and nowadays, if I play chess, I had a game with my brother a little while ago, that's sort of one of the first things I'll ask is like, um, have you ever heard of en pensant? Because that took me by surprise. Most people I've played with have not heard of this either. So for something that's been part of the game for centuries, it's not very well advertised. And if you've got a little game portable thing or if you're playing it on the computer, be careful because that one took me by surprise. I guess we should wrap this up because it is very lengthy, but uh, for those who are not familiar with how the pawn normally works, he can, in his front row, he's lucky in that he can actually move either one or two spaces. That's actually pretty significant, especially for what is a very well-established first setup that you want to get your pieces into if you can. We'll talk about that in a future episode, but basically, the fact that the pawn can either move one or two spaces is very significant. Also, and this is again for people who don't really know the game of chess very well, except for this en pensant move, which took me by surprise, generally speaking the pawn can only capture on a diagonal. So it's a little bit like the bishop. He moves forward, uh, echoing his ancient past from the game of Shang-Chi and also from Liobo, but if somebody is on a diagonal from him, he can actually take that piece on a diagonal move. Furthermore, and an interesting tip of the hat to Chess's uh, kind of younger brother checkers, if the pawn can get all the way to the opposite end of the board, which doesn't happen very often, but it, it can occur, when he reaches the final row, he can actually be promoted the player can choose what the piece is going to be. Generally, players will go with a queen, uh, but you can actually opt for the new promoted piece to be either a knight, a rook, or a, bush, or a bishop. And it is possible under this kind of circumstance to actually have two queens on the board, which will immediately spell doom for the opposite player. So well, what do you do if you only have a standard chess set and you don't have a separate or an extra queen just kicking around. Uh, apparently in, in real competition chess, they will actually go and borrow another piece from another chessboard. Um, but if you are uh, kind of stuck for pieces, you could always just flip your rook upside down to represent the new queen. Well, there you go. There is the pawn, the lowly pawn, the poor fella who hardly ever gets any love. I'm very, very pleased to finally get talking about these guys because they all have a very diverse and interesting history, especially the pawn, which is very unfortunate because he's kind of looked down upon by all the other pieces. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed that. I will be getting more Chess Chess episodes out more often because I had a very positive response and I just love this game. So until next time, we'll see you down the rabbit hole.